We've got New York in the house. We've got Philadelphia. Queens, Delaware, Philly, Ithaca, New York, Maryland, DC. Awesome. Philadelphia. Very cool. You know, and we had a youth retreat this morning via Zoom, and we all talked about our favorite fruits. And I bring that up because, you know, watermelon popped into my mind. And you think, the kids were like, why watermelon, Miss Janae? You know, and, you know, watermelon can be kind of hard on the outside. Like, a magazine is, is print, right? But it's not until you crack it open, till you peer inside, till you let the juicy stories kind of sink in, that you get the full benefit of a watermelon, of a magazine, of a book of a movie, of a person. And the other beautiful thing about a watermelon is that they're filled with seeds. And these seeds could remain in the watermelon if it's never opened, or these seeds can take root outside in the ground. And so I think of each of the contributors, each of the young people that have been a part of Motivos over the years of the almost 15 years now, and those seeds go out into the world and they're making an impact, they're making a contribution. And the other thing that we talked about this morning was that those seeds need fertile soil and they need raindrops and they need sunshine. And so we talked a little bit about who was that soil for us? Who are those raindrops? Where do we find sunshine? And that's where the supporters in our lives come into play. That's where our parents come in. That's where our counselors come in. That's where our teachers and after school program coordinators and mentors come into the picture to help those seeds grow and blossom and flourish and make more watermelons to pour into more people's lives. And so that was a little bit of the conversation we had just this morning. And the youth do meet, uh, we meet weekly and we take turns talking about college and career exploration creative writing and character building. And once a quarter, we have a retreat. So that's a little bit of the, the background information. And I'm just gonna share my screen here. So Motivos, if you aren't familiar with Motivos, it has four sections in each edition. So we've got culture, life, college, and career. And I started the magazine when I was in graduate school studying bilingual bicultural studies. My mom's side is Hispanic through Spain to Puerto Rico to New York City. My father's side is Polish Hungarian. And I did a bit of exploration of my own roots in graduate school. And I took courses in bilingual bicultural studies in Caribbean Spanish. I took courses in pluralism and society, in bilingual education. And what really captured me, and probably because both of my parents are teachers, were teachers, um, was the academic achievement gap, the access gap the equity gap, the opportunity gap. And when I saw a gap, I was like, how do, we, how do we close this divide? How can I be a bridge person in this sphere? And so I did my thesis on that. I twisted the arm of my advisor to help me write a business plan because I didn't want my thesis to just sit on a shelf and collect dust. I wanted to do something. I wanted to take action. And how many of you out there know that there's a need in this world there's some gap, some lack, some area where you could apply yourself. And you know that if you just focused on it, you could do something big. Just put that in the chat if you could, whether it's uh, racial injustice, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's access to technology, what is that in your life? And just put that in the chat because those are the things that the students at Motivos think about. They talk about, we discuss things like that and we bring those stories to light in the magazine to try to help the community become more aware of what it is that's facing us every day. And so that's what I was looking at in graduate school and I said, what can I do? I took my background in media. So I worked in publishing in Boston, Massachusetts, in Sydney, Australia, in Philadelphia. And I said, how can I harness the power of media to bring educational resources and role models to a community that needs the access. And at the same time, how can I build a platform so that the stories get out from that community to help shape the social narrative? Because mainline media was not doing it. It was not giving the true full stories of what was happening in the community. So I wanted to 
create the platform and pass the mic. So today I'm gonna to show you a little bit about what that platform is and then pass the mic. So Motivo has four sections, culture, life, college, and careers. Culture, because that is where we find the strength in our roots. We figure out what made us who we are, who poured into us so that we may pour into others. Whose shoulders are we standing on? Who's got our back? That's culture. And there's stories about cultural expressions and exchange, and you'll hear from the contributors in that regard. And then life. So life section of the magazine is navigating where we are today to get to where we want to go tomorrow. What are those barriers in front of us? What is holding back our mental abilities from jumping to the next step? Well, who's got us in chains? Well, how have we got ourselves held back? How can we overcome those difficulties, those barriers? College application process, right? Affording it. Who can help us in that regard? We've got experts in that section of the magazine and careers exploring different career fields. So we do that in our weekly sessions through interviews with experts, through panel discussions, through peer-to-peer -peer talking. And that's what we're tackling in the content of the magazine as well. Now the magazine is not just two dimensional guys, the magazine is 3D. And what I mean by 3D is that we're out there in the community. Right now with coronavirus, we're doing a lot by Zoom. Uh, last week I spoke in Tokyo, Japan via Zoom. So there's a lot of things that Zoom has, yeah, opened up to us, right? Even as it's closed some doors, these are pictures when the community was more open. So Alicia there, our poet ambassador on stage at the Only Arts Festival. We've got a video camp that we did for a gear up program at Drexel University. Sasha's on stage over there with her blue hair, which caused her to get kicked out of school. And she's speaking up about why self-expression was so important right there at the stage at Ferida de Barrio with Taya Puerto de Queño. So that's how we're getting out in the community. These are some of the other ways we get involved we do youth empowerment programs. And so on the bottom left, you can see a peer leadership conference that was with 72 students from nine different schools last fall. And in the middle there, you see a picture of us doing an interview. That's at Concilio's old building, which is torn down now. Um, when Alan and Kyrie were on the team, they just graduated from high school. That was with some immigration lawyers and upper left interviewing uh, folks in the military. So we've engaged over 30,000 youth now since 2006 in these programs, which can be brought out to schools and after school programs. So speak up at the end if you want one of the young people to come speak to your school. It's easier now with Zoom or if you'd like an interactive program to come to your school. We go out and do workshops, keynotes, conferences. So you can see, uh, this is Mariana Brassetti in the bottom. The middle one is Joy at Tayer Puerto Riqueño presenting. Josh is doing a video uh, workshop here with kids right in Fairhill. And so some of those topics are write your way to college, find your why, find your future, how to ace the interview. So these are for high school and college students. We also do youth development for youth program workers. And a snippet of behind the scenes, so the mentoring component. High school, college students can come in as a mentee and move up to an intern and move up to a paid stipend bearing fellowship. So you'll meet students at all ranges of that spectrum today as well. And we are grateful to have grown the magazine organically. There are subscription agencies that help us do this, but we're out into about 1400 schools, youth serving organizations, public libraries and prisons. Right now we have about 85,000 readers in 42 states and four countries, and it keeps growing. We're adding a lot of digital components at this stage. So that's kind of how we've pivoted with the times. And these are some of the organizations that we've been fortunate enough to work with. And I mention this because as those relationships have grown, as those doors have opened over the years, I'm bringing the youth through those doors. So they've traveled with me then to present at the US Hispanic Leadership Conference at what was the National Council of La Raza and now is Unidos US. Um, the alumni who've gone on to work for NBC Peacock Studios have given us private tours. So these are connections that then open further doors. So we're super grateful to work with different partners and we open doors to our partner schools through these partnerships as well. So for example, Alni, Mariana Brassetti, Kensington Kappa, Kensington Business, CAP, they've all been the recipients of guest speakers from the US Hispanic Leadership Institute coming into their schools at no charge because of their partnership, um, subscribing in bulk from the magazine. So we try to open doors 
And I personally put as much effort as I can into doing that because I think it's so important. I grew up in a town of less than a thousand people with a traffic light on each end. And there weren't a lot of opportunities to do things outside of those walls, if you will. If you didn't have a car and you didn't have a license, if you didn't have a parent who was in the know, who had other connections, it, was, it could be very, a very sheltered um, experience in terms of exposure to the world. And so I know from firsthand experience how important it is to get those doors to open just a crack and let especially the students who wanna peer through that crack and see the rest of the world, give them that opportunity not just to peer through, but to walk through. And today you're gonna to get to meet those students who are walking through those doors and getting in the magazine, getting their voice heard on the platform that is Motivos. And today we are super, super grateful and super thankful to Tayer Puerto Ricanu, who's been around 45 years, who's preventing, presenting their platform to us to further explore our voice and get the word out there. So without further ado, I'm gonna call up, I guess you could say our first contributor, um, Karime Font. So Karime, I'm passing the mic. Hi everyone. As Janae said, my name is Karime Font. I am an 11th grader at the Arts Academy at Benjamin Rush, where I go for visual arts, and I am an editorial fellow for the Motivos magazine. This week actually marks my first year as being part of the Motivos team. I became involved at last year's Meet the Author series here at the Thayid. I joined because I have always liked writing, but I wasn't sure if I could make it into something productive. Working for the magazine has really helped me develop my voice as both a writer and as a person. And it has really changed me in ways that probably would have, devel would have developed later in life or not at all. Before getting involved, I was really lost with what I wanted to do after high school. And almost a year later, I have met so many wonderful people, participated in so many opportunities presented to me by Motivos. And I am considering studying journalism in college. Um, so my first article that I wrote for Motivos, it's part of the resilience edition, is called the Yuma in Cuba. And this is about my experiences visiting my family in Cuba and how that society compares to the one I know here in the United States. So just some behind the scenes info for you guys. Um, this, this article was originally seven pages and by some miracle of God, we managed to cut it down to two. Um, here's an excerpt of that. As a Cuban American Yuma, I was able to briefly experience the duality of the Cuban persona and learn about a lifestyle and a value system that is different than my own. The obscurity that clouded my conscience cleared as the diversified nature that lines the highways, the humanity, resilience, and family values of my people and the vibrant living timeline that is Havana became fragments of my own identity. I was finally able to meet the untouchable island to understand some of its mystique and feel like so many other Cuban Americans do, that despite its defects, it holds an eternal glow in the midst of our humanness. Um, so I wrote this because I felt like it was important to talk about an island that is comparably isolated from the rest of the world and to express my perspective as a Yuma, which means a person from the United States and or in my case, um, as a part, as a part Cuban American. Um, and I just wanted to clear up any curiosities or misconceptions people may have about Cuba. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hi, Karime. It's really Hi. cool. Can you hear me? Yes. It, it was a great piece. Um, it, was, it was a great piece. Uh, so my question is, are you looking forward returning to Cuba? Um, in the next few years, or is this a, like a one-time thing? And um, and uh, because the piece was nice, I don't know if your your plans are to return um, to Cuba. Um, so I visited Cuba twice. Each visit lasted a week and some change. And um, I I do plan to return to Cuba to visit my family and perhaps for a longer a longer period of time. I'm not sure when because with this whole coronavirus, it's hard to tell when everything can happen again. But I plan to go back soon, as soon as everything, um, as soon as there's a more certain future.
Um, and Rafi asks, ¿Qué es una yuma? Or what is a yuma? Um, a yuma, it could mean, well, it means two things, actually. Um, if you're using it as a noun, it mean, it's Cuban slang for like the United States. So for example, um, oh, ella está en la yuma, meaning like she's in the United States. Or um, if you're using it as like, or it could also refer to somebody who's from the United States. So for example, yo soy una yuma because I'm from the United States, even though I'm Cuban, like I am Cuban, but I was born here. So that would make me a Yuma. Um, India asks, how devastating is the embargo? Um, well, it is like, the effects are very, um, in Cuba, the effect, like you can see the, how it's been affecting the people, um, it's just, it like, it, there's a lot of like problems, like not only with food, but with just with resources and just access to other things that they might, uh, that they might have had before, even if it was just a little bit of access to these, to what was happening in the outside world. Because now with this embargo, like everything just feels so isolated. And you can see that like compared to the last time I, the first, you can see that compared to the first time I went there. Before I went there, there was, of course there was an embargo, but there wasn't the one, like the one that was more recently like put in. And the second time I went there, there was a very hard time finding like food in general. Um, my dad, when he went to go get water for the house with my uncle who's, who lives there, they had to visit like three different places to find water, drinkable water. So it's just, it's it's very heartbreaking to see like how this embargo is affecting the people and my family. Okay, so if that's all the questions everybody has, I will now pass it on to Gabby. Take it away. Hi, my name is Gabby. Um, I'm in ninth grade and I go to St. Basil Academy. Um, so I started in Motivos because my mom, my dad found their page in Facebook and then took us to the last Meet the Author um, last year, or was it this year? I forgot. Um, but we went to the last Meet the Author and then after that, like, I started going to the meetings and this was my first published piece. Um, it's about when, so I, I might, so I had to change schools or I had to like move. So it was cause I was nervous about having like the change in my life. And like, it was a big deal to me. So I had to, um, so I wrote a piece about, about that and, um, at first, like I was really scared. And then towards the end, like after I kept on doing what I like to do, which is swimming, like I started feeling better and then like more calmer, which is like basically what the poem is about. Um, I dive into the pool head first full of worries, my head spinning with restless thoughts about my future. I'm frightened by the big changes happening in my life. My face hits the water and I realize that nothing is going to be the same ever again. My body is completely underwater. The water is cool and bubbly, but comes with soft muffled noises. My feet are tingly from the little bubbles and my arms are chilled by the cool water. Yet in the tranquility, my mind is agitated. My mind forgets of all my brooding thoughts as I remember the need to breathe. My head emerges to the surface and I gasp for air. And for a split second, my mind comes to ease. However, when I put my head back, hold on. When I put my head back into the worrisome sea, my legs start moving. Hold on, I'm nervous. It's okay. I put my my legs start moving at a faster rate. Meeting. Sorry. 
My legs start moving at a fast rate, meeting the air, then coming back down. My arms start swinging at a constant rate and a constant pattern that I repeat in my head over and over again. One, two, three, four, five, six, breathe. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, breathe. One, two, three, four, five, six, breathe. My mind is calmed by the steady repetition. However, as I finish a lap, I need to do a flip turn, ruining the comfort of my pattern. And the restless thoughts come back. This time, I can't escape my worries for they are too strong. I remember my dilemmas. I remember that I might never see some of my friends again. I remember that whatever I choose will impact my entire life for better or worse. I remember that everything. I remember that everything that was once familiar to me will not be anymore. I fight back tears. All my worries turn into anger, which turns into determination. I start to swim, swim even faster. My arms start paddling furiously, furiously, and my tire legs kick faster. The forward motion brings a new calm to my troubled mind. Tranquility bubbles up, soothes my worries, change doesn't need to be feared. Life is all about changes. No matter how big the dilemma is, I know that I can thrive to see the wall and the muffled voices become louder. The denial stops and I realize there's more to life than staying in a place I've always known. There are adventures, risks, and potential for greatness. My mind that was once filled with despair is now filled with ambition because I know that I can get through that what lies ahead. I am filled with excitement as I reach out to touch the wall. I smile slowly, spreads across my face as I pull myself out of the pool, ready to dive into the next one. Aww. Thank you guys. <laughs> Go Gabby, yeah, that was beautiful. I see round of applause, exactly. All right, mommy, it's all right. That's hard stuff and that poem was deep because it was personal and you could see how much she was struggling to even like revisit that time in her life, which wasn't that long ago, right? It's fresh, it's a it's a feeling. And now her school, I, I think I can share this, right? Her school's closing. So now she has to change schools again. So. I don't know if you're able to take questions, Gabby, if you just want to catch your breath and take some at the end, you let us know. Um, maybe put a thumbs up if you're okay to answer questions. If not, maybe at the end, what do you think? People are saying beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Amazing. Loved your poem. It hit home for me. Huge high fives. Animo Gabby. Yeah, go, go. <laughs> we love you, Gabby. Thank you for sharing. I'll let you catch your breath. And we'll have some time at the end for you to share. Um, I see Gaynor has joined us now. Gaynor is coming in from Costa Rica, guys. And I, I think he may be presenting en español. Si, ¿Sí, Gaynor? ¿Quieres hablar en español? It's possible. It's, it's sí, possible. Total no is problem. possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> Let so me much. go back into my PowerPoint and get Gaynor's. And then I will bring it up for you all to see. This is Beautiful. So the front cover of our last magazine um, is a picture taken in Costa Rica. It's the Vision Edition. And Gaynor is the biologist on an island called Isla del Coco, which is between the Galapagos and the western coast of Costa Rica. So it's a magical, beautiful part of the world that I aspire to get to one day. And the connection came through my husband, whose friend from high school works on the island and knows Gaynor and is a park ranger there. And the park ranger's son went to volunteer for 30, 30 days. He's only 12, Matias. I don't think he can join us today, but you've got to read the story. It's really amazing. Without um, further ado, let me share my screen and get you guys Gaynor Golfin. Thank you very much. And the introduction for English is small 
is a little no speak English. And my name is Henry Golfing. I am working for 15 years in Cocos Island National Park. Cocos National Park is the most beautiful the national park into Costa Rica. I am going into Cocos Island in the 36 years in the boat. In the for working on the 21 persons, the only rangers and two on two paramedics or doctors. Uh, is usuality for 30 days in Cocos Island or four weeks in the in the national park, staying and the working in the for uh, reaction. Um, its principal problem is the fishermen. The fishermen all the time around all the island. I am the working for the control is is different uh, worse in 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 the Cocos. Uh, on the Cocos, only one. Uh, 11, C11, uh, 17, C17, 17, and the um, Rangers, um, only three women. Is, is the, the principal uh, activity in the, in the Cocos Island and the tourists of for dive is the 50 and the top, top 10, top 10 say, see the top 10 for the place for diving. Eh, y yo quisiera agradecerles eh, mucho a Jenny, a Michael Pérez, que es mi compañero guardaparque, que se pueden ver en la foto con su hijo, y a, y a Arturo, por, por a, al señor sí, eh, Arturo Agüero, por ayudarnos y hacer posible llevar eh, este pequeño reporte o esta pequeña experiencia de un guardaparques en, en este sitio que es sitio patrimonio de la humanidad que recientemente fue eh, denominado como Blue Park o sitio de importancia a nivel mundial y que nos enorgullece mucho y que queremos que ustedes conozcan más de las áreas protegidas que tenemos en América porque consideramos que, como dicen por ahí, eh, para proteger lo que tenemos, eh, tenemos que conocerlo. Y créanme que todo de una u otra manera está interconectado. Lo que hacemos en la tierra nos afecta en el mar. Como dice nuestra gran científica Silvia Earl, que tal vez algunos la conocen, sin azul no hay verde y sin guardaparques tampoco hay conservación. Y yo creo que todos los que amamos la naturaleza, así como ustedes que se van a interesar en este reporte, somos esos guardaparques y amantes de la naturaleza. Muchas gracias y muchas bendiciones de parte de todos mis compañeros. Engulfing within what affects the earth affects the sea for those of you who don't speak Spanish. And without the blue, there is no green. The interconnectedness of all of us. Rafi's giving a thumbs up. That was beautiful. And in the magazine, there's four full pages designated to this. So there's two in English and there's two in Spanish. So if you know one language or the other, you can use the magazine to figure out the language that you don't know yet. That's the beauty, um, part of the beauty of the magazine. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Gaynor Golfin? In inglés o en español, no importa. Lisa can translate, I could attempt to translate. Carmen could jump in there, Arturo could jump in there. Many people could jump in, Olive. We have one question. I'm not sure if this was for Gabby or um, for Heine, but uh, what inspired you to start writing? I think oh. that's for Gabby. I think so too. All right, we'll say that one for the end. Or she said for both, either one can answer. We'll ask Gabby at the end, that one. But Here's one, how do I volunteer? It looks beautiful. That's coming in from Roy Juarez Jr., one of the speakers that we've brought here to Philadelphia. He's a nationally acclaimed speaker. Uh, so if you don't know Roy Juarez Jr., look him up. But he's asking, how do I volunteer? Como ser un voluntario, Gainer? Sí, 30 días. Eh, sí. Roy está muy interesado de ir como voluntario, que se comunique con Arturo eh, o Jenny y con mucho gusto. Eh, él viene acá a Costa Rica y después de ahí nosotros eh, nos encargamos. Eh, por un problema en la pandemia, esperamos a tener la apertura del voluntariado para el 2021. 
pero es bienvenido, no se tiene que pagar nada, nosotros le damos la alimentación, eh, son 30 días, se trabajan 6 días y un día es el día libre para conocer y, y disfrutar y nos ayudan en muchas tareas, en diferentes tareas. Es una experiencia muy gratificante y estamos a la puerta siempre y cuando podamos coordinar de la mejor manera para que sí pueda tener esa, esa experiencia y acá los estaremos esperando. Y hay una limitación a la cantidad de gente que pueden voluntar en el mismo tiempo, Gainer. Eh, de, por, es por disposición del barco. Ajá. Es okay. por el, los espacios en los barcos. Nosotros viajamos en un barco de contrato y un convenio con las operadoras de turismo. Son, como les dije, eran 36 horas hasta viajar allá. Y es todo, es diferente a los, a los espacios. Entonces, eh, sería, digamos, buscar la oportunidad de coordinar bien si hay un espacio o un proyecto específico en los que quisieran participar y acá eh, nos podemos, digamos, incluir en, ese, en esos trabajos que, para que vean esa belleza en, a vivo y en todo color. So I think that we are going to look for uh, a funder, una patrocinador for un, un viaje de grupo hasta Costa Rica para voluntar en, volunteer, para ser voluntarios en la isla de, de Coco, Gainer. I think so, because look, Michelle wants to go. Rodolfo says, podemos ir a Costa Rica en grupo. Everyone wants <laughs> to go. So he said some of the limitations are like the, how many passengers can go on the boat. And it's a 36 hour ride from the mainland to the island. And of course, right now things are kind of closed because of the coronavirus. They're waiting for things to open up again, which will probably be 2021. Yeah, everyone's saying this sounds so cool. Que chévere. Woo, Costa Rica es hermoso. Si, sí, Michelle studied abroad in Costa Rica. I've been there. So Gainer is saying be in touch with Arturo, es mi esposo, or myself. and. <laughs> This is going to be a goal, guys, because travel is very limited right now. So when things open, <laughs> we're all taking all our time off. We're going to Costa Rica. We're going to get to East Lake of Coco. I can see this now. <laughs> Someone's taking a sabbatical to go. There we go. All right. Roy is in. <laughs> wow. Muchísimas gracias. Any other questions for Señor Golfín? Hemos tenido, sí, grupos que nos han visitado y poder tener que tengan esa experiencia consideramos que estamos muy abiertos hemos estado muy abiertos a que a eso a que nos visiten a que nos visiten para poder nosotros eh, compartir con con todos digamos la naturaleza que tenemos nosotros allá eh, como le digo es lo único problema es ese es el a la hora de, de tener los espacios en los en los barcos Ok, vamos a ver acá. Hay una pregunta más. Sí. Um, ¿Cuál es algo que um, la naturaleza le ha enseñado sobre la vida? Eh, es eso, a amar y cuidar y respetar. ¿Verdad? Es un tema de respetar la naturaleza. Ha sido un tema de, de, de respetar la naturaleza. Es más, más que todo lo que, lo que nosotros hemos tenido... En, en cuenta eso, amar y tener la, y respetar la, la naturaleza. Este video es, un, es cortico, como les dije, lo que quiero es enseñarles un poco, los, los, este video lo hicimos para la celebración del, del Día de los Océanos y lo que quiero es enseñarles así rápidamente. Muchas gracias. Gracias a usted. Wow. Thank you. Ah, don't you just breathe easier seeing all that green and all that blue, you guys? Whee! 
Makes us want to go right out there. Gracias, señor Gainer, por fin. So next up, we have the section of life. So the life, like I talked about, is how do we get over those barriers in front of us to see past what's going on? And so I'm going to bring up now Liz Mari Ortiz, and she has several ish, several articles published in the editions this year in Motivo. Hi, good evening, everyone. This, this here. So my name is um, Liz Mari Ortiz, and I'm a sophomore at Holy Family University, and my major is English and Secondary Education. I started writing for Motivos in August of 2017, so already three years now, going on four years. But actually, my mom knew Janae from um, a long time ago, working in a newspaper, El Sol. And since they knew each other, mommy said, you know, Janae has a magazine, and you like writing. I've always had a passion for writing. She said, maybe you could write for her. And we set up the interview in August, and I've been writing for Motivos ever since. And I've had so many articles written and published in the magazine, um, starting from personal stories to even interviews with um, Christian Daniels, who's actually a Billboard nominated artist, which was really, really amazing considering I only did that as a senior in high school, really. So through Motivos, I've actually been given a lot of opportunities for writing. And it really helped me grow as a writer and also as a person because I got to meet so many different people thanks to Janae and her connections and all the things I was allowed to do through Motivos. And in this edition in particular, I actually have two articles. The first one is um, In Defense of the Visco Girl, which was um, kind of like an informative piece that I wanted to write. Um, some of you guys might remember that in summer of 2019, there was this trend on TikTok, like the Visco Girl, and people became very environmentally aware. You know, there was uh, the metal straw trend and people made um, trends of reusable bags. Like you could buy a $50 one at Urban Outfitters and people were really become, becoming more aware of the environment and how we can impact it, especially people that were younger, which was something that wasn't heard of before. And like the last speaker was saying, you know, the environment is something we have to protect. And it's something that if we want it to remain beautiful, we have to take extra steps. So in this article, I have some research-based um, habits that you can partake in, such as ditching plastic, cleaning, eating, and lifestyle changes. And I wanted to highlight that in this article because I feel like something that especially younger people should be looking into is how we can leave less of a carbon emission footprint, but rather um, a footprint that rather like encourages the growth of green and clean air in the atmosphere. And the other article I wrote was an interview with Gabriela Sanchez. It's called Through the Eyes of the Artist. She was actually our Inspirations in the Community nominee for this um, edition. And what she's doing is she's actually uplifting the Hispanic community through art and theater, which is something that I actually am very passionate about because I went to an arts high school. And what Gabriela is doing is that she's actually creating plays and theatrical productions that are based in the Hispanic community. And they actually tell the stories of Latino characters, Latinx characters. And it's something that was very lacking in the theater industry, as she said, if you read in the article, she talks about how representation, yep, Power Street, Power Street Theater Company, that's her company. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> and what she's um, really trying to do is bring more Hispanic voices into the art community because we are very underrepresented there and especially through Hispanic based stories. So not just, you know, the famous plays but rather making more realistic, more grounded and more inclusive stories. And she also offers a lot of advice for people that are aspiring artists, whether it be art in general because she also is a physical artist like she has art that she sells, but also the written word and acting. And she says that self-advocacy helps us preserve our community and especially our art. Because one thing I do notice is that art is something that people tend to be afraid of, especially when pursuing writing as a career, drawing, acting. But she points out that it's something that really should be preserved and encouraged, especially in our youth, because it's one of the best ways that we can, we can leave our mark on the world and uplift our community, especially the Latinx community. So yeah. Are there any questions that you guys have? Rafi's saying Power Street. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gabby's actually doing a training right now or she'd be with us. <laughs> yeah. Roy says yes. Let me see. 
What is my career goal? Well, when I was little, I always wanted to be like a published author. I love writing stories, but you know, that's being like a published author for like fiction is really hard. So I kind of then um, through Janae, I started writing like nonfiction pieces, like journalistic writing, which is something I have always also been interested in. And I've been doing it through Motivos. And so I kind of want to do like English teacher slash magazine writer, I guess for now, because, and really just see where that takes me, you know, what doors it opens because I always love writing. So in some way, shape or form, writing is always going to be in my life, whether it's teaching it or doing it for like big magazines and stuff. Thank you for your question. Are there any other questions? You can also like uh, raise your hand to ask them as well. Why did you spend? So I'm not gonna lie, I kind of became a Visco girl. I didn't really get the oversized shirts though because it wasn't really my look, but I did get a Kankin book bag and metal straws. I really feel like it was a trend that no one was expecting. Um, when I saw that it was trending and just the way it just became so big, like anywhere you want, it was like Kankin book bag, scrunchies, oversized shirt, metal straws, and it was intense. And the fact that it was a trend based on being environmentally aware and eco-friendly was really surprising because it's not really something that we encourage the youth to take part in because it's like, oh, it's not cool to be eco-friendly, but suddenly it was cool and it was fashionable. And I feel like by making it fashionable, they actually encourage people to do things that they would have otherwise not done. And people also made fun of the trend a little bit, like they kind of said it was basic. And I wanted to write this to kind of show like, even if it was just like a basic trend, it was something that actually was beneficial to the environment. And it also kind of set a good example for younger people because people still like, I still use my metal straw. It's not something that really completely disappeared. It's always kind of taken with us. So they weren't that bad of a trend, the Visco curls. Thank you very much. And is Pilar Gonzalez on the call? I know sometimes people call in under someone else's name on their screen. So this is as if we're standing in the room at Tyre and we're saying, is Pilar out there? <laughs> All right, we have one more question actually. Okay. Do you have any ideas on other trends that could help improve the, the environment slash the world? Do you want to share from your piece there, Liz Marie? Oh yeah, I can. Sorry, I was responding to another thing in the chat. Oh, I did that privately by accident. Right in the article. So there's some facts in the beginning. So just to kind of like solidify the notion that it is actually beneficial, but a few trends, so for ditching plastic, there were things like bamboo brushes, using metal water bottles, which I think a lot of people already do. And obviously the metal straws, but if you get a metal straw, don't throw it out. I, I threw mine out in the middle of a mall and I had to fish through the trash for it because I forgot. But it goes to show how we're used to just consuming waste, like just consume, throw it out. So I, I had to fish through it, it was embarrassing, but it's, I still have it, <laughs> I washed it. And um, fabric bags were something I definitely like. It's actually even more convenient than plastic bags. And I see that everywhere. Like you could get cute ones at Urban Outfitters if you want to be bougie, or you could get cheaper ones. Um, clean eating was something also that I feel has been a lot more encouraged now because there's this whole like, with quarantine came like this diet and like healthy lifestyle culture, which is good to a certain extent. So really the tips I put in there that have been proven are like buying locally grown produce because it has that has less like preservatives and stuff and it's more more natural eating less packaged foods because obviously that has a lot of you know preservatives in it and also trying vegetarianism or veganism not converting completely but I actually started like trying things like vegan sausages or like sometimes I just wouldn't make a meat or I wouldn't use dairy like I would use um you could use almond milk it's that's not really like a dairy or oat milk and things like that. Like those are trends that I feel like have really stuck. It's not even like a trend, it's just like culture now, but you're actually really um, doing a change for the better. Definitely a clean eater. Yeah, I feel like it just tastes better too. Once you start, these are habits that, I know it sounds redundant, like reduce, reuse, recycle. You get told that since you were in middle school, but 
once you actually start doing it, like I would feel bad if I'm not taking out my recycling bin. It's something that just kind of becomes part of who you are. And at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're trying to leave behind like just a cleaner, better planet because we only get one, we have to protect it because we can't just buy another one. So if you wanna just take these steps, like the other ones that are included in the article too, um, another trend that I think probably, cause you asked about trends, I think um, fast fashion is gonna die out and it's possibly gonna be, because I mean, it's more expensive, but like, more eco-friendly clothing. I think people are getting into that, especially because thrifting has become very popular. So I'm calling that thrifting is gonna be the best trend. <laughs> and Roy is asking which article has affected you the most as a writer? Oh, I didn't even see the chat, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think definitely, I think all of them, like I loved all of them. All of them have been so memorable. I feel like the most as a writer it has to probably be the interview with Christian Daniel because that was such, it was almost scary because here I am and I'm just like, okay, I'm going to interview like a billboard nominated artist. And yeah, that's the, that's the issue. And I was just like, okay, I don't know if I'm just, if I'm even qualified to do this because it was almost intimidating. Like I could literally see this guy performing on my TV and I'm asking him questions. And he was just like, Adoracion. like he was the best person like to talk to. He was so chill and so nice. And he had so much to like say, and it was such a natural conversation. And I feel like writing that, it just all flowed out so naturally. I barely even had to edit that article too. You know, sometimes you have to edit a lot, but that one just came out and it was just like perfect. And it was such a fun article. And also um, the article I did on one of my classmates on um, Erica Rivera, she, that was an article that I wanted to do for her, especially because she, um, she was really talking about mental health and that issue. And this was the mindfulness edition. And it actually was like the front, my first like front cover um, article. Yeah, and it was actually a picture I, I took and I edited it and everything. In high and school. All, yeah, in high school. Was, that was, I did that in my high school art class. I was editing that picture and writing that article. And that was, that's another edition, an article that really kind of stuck with me because it was really important for her too. She was at a point where she felt like you know, as a photographer and as an artist herself, she was like, am I going to get recognized? And I was like, I got you. Like, let me, let me do something for you real quick. And she really, like, really, really appreciated it. And that's kind of was like, that was my payment for it. I was happy about that. And that was volume 13, number one. We are now at volume 14, number three. So Liz, oh forever ago. <laughs> for a while. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I know I have a portfolio of like all my articles and I just see that one. And I'm just like, I love that picture so much recycle coffee grounds like compost yeah, I wish I could compost but like I like low-key don't like worms so I don't know if I could have a little like compost <laughs> thing. I would probably forget about it and just start smelling bad who would be your dream interview so like I know it's basic but like I feel like I would like to interview like a big artist or like not even big but like an artist that like I adore like I don't know if you guys know like Sabrina Claudia or something like she's at that level where like I could possibly interview her like she's like Ariana Grande would be like hard to land, you know what I mean? But like, I don't know, like someone that's like part of the like Latino community and Ariana Grande is not part of the Latino community, but um, she is like a Hispanic artist or something that's like, you know, up and coming or like really good. It'd be fun to interview. That'd be my dream interview. Or a right. politician. <laughs> You gotta speak your dreams into reality. Wait yes, I will. Know. If anyone on this call has any connections with Sabrina Claudio, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, I'm manifesting it right now. Yes, that's I right. Will interview. <laughs> speak um, it into existence. Is Pilar out there? I wanna see if Pilar is there. If not, I'm just gonna share. Can you guys see my screen now? And Liz Mari's sticking around. If you have more questions, I wanna make sure everyone gets the chance to speak. So Pilar actually came to us. One of my student interns was researching who could answer questions for us on the front of relationships, whether it's between uh, partners or parents, children or peers, et cetera. And they came across a couple of um, child psychiatrists and bilingual child, um, bilingual child psychologists and psychologists. They narrowed in on Pilar. So she was our first um, relationship columnist in the relationship section. And she was getting her PhD at Temple University at the time. We were able to meet her in person in Philadelphia. She now works for a maximum security prison in California and has returned to the West Coast, but still writes for us remotely. And so uh, this is her section in the magazine. And I thought she was gonna be joining us today, but just look up the relationship section when you have a chance. Really pertinent steps that I've used in my own life that just take you one, 
beat ahead of where you were before to deepen the relationships that you have. It helps with communication, particularly. It helps with distance. It helps with um, listening versus speaking. So check that section out. And then I'll bring Brian Rodriguez on. So Brian is a guest columnist. Um, the students voiced that they wanted to hear more about financial stewardship and what to do with their money. And they were very interested in hearing about that topic. So we reached out to Brian, who was a former inspiration in our community recipient of Motivo's magazine. So Brian, I know you're juggling work right now, but if you can jump on, we'd love to have you and hear from you at this time. There he is. <laughs> no problem at all, hey everyone. Thank you for having me. Some background, my name is Brian Rodriguez. As Janae said, if you want to track back my Motivo's relationship, I could not tell you. Probably back a decade or so. <laughs> I think Janae might have a better sense than I do. It seems like for as long as I can remember, my mom and my family's been involved with Motivos and their writing and in the workshops and all. So some background on myself. I'm currently living in New York City. I work at Goldman Sachs. And what Goldman Sachs is, it's an investment banking firm. So what investment banking is, like traditional Wall Street is what I do essentially. Like I help companies run the stock market is an easy way to sum it up. Moved here after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in 2018, born and raised in Philly. So I grew up in North Philadelphia, went to a school out on the main line called Harvard, Penn, and now in New York City. And the reason why I wanted to write this article talking about your financial vision being 2020 is because I started, I started late, probably late college. And then when I actually moved to New York City and got a full-time job, started to understand money management, budgeting, personal finance, things I was forced into it. So I kind of learned by mistakes more than being proactive. Like I had no idea, like, how do I create a budget? How do I save? How do I invest? All these core key competencies of personal finance, no one ever taught me. This is not something I was discussed in my house. And unfortunately, this, isn't, this is not something that's not often discussed in you know, underserved minority households that are financially insecure because there's not the surplus of money going around to have these conversations in a way that's not awkward or embarrassing within the household. So what I'm trying to do now, and I work with financial literacy organization in New York, and I did previously in Philadelphia, is trying to teach financial literacy to high school students, predominantly black and Latinx students from underserved communities to try to remove that stigma of being scared of money. I think that's the biggest aspect, and that's what I wanted to get across here, is that, you know, I think a quote I mentioned was, you know, achieving financial success is not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, it's a long journey, and you get there by short milestones here and there. So some background on what I'm doing around personal finance, trying to help others come into, you know, financial success by understanding just the basics of personal finance and how they interact with you on a daily basis. So that's something I'm really passionate about, worried about creating smart goals in this article, which are specific, easily attainable goals to get to where you want to be in life in the future. And I'll leave it at that. I don't want to ramble on for too much, but happy to answer questions about college, about my career, personal finance, whatever you want to ask. Hey, Eric asks, um... He says, some people I know say, I have nothing to save up for, so why am I saving money? How would you respond to that? You're saving, I mean, you have a future, right? I mean, you want to save for retirement at the very least. You don't want to work for the rest of your life. So you want to start creating a fund, creating savings and investments that you can use to retire at 65. So one way, you've probably heard this term before, it's called a 401k. It's a retirement plan through your employers or whatever company you work for they'll help you build funds for you to retire and invest in the stock market for you. So you should be saving and investing, honestly, just to better yourself. I don't have to want a car next year or want to buy a house in the next three, but I know at one point in my future, I don't want to work anymore and I just want to relax and go chill in the National Park in Costa Rica and not have to worry about bills. So that's what I'm saving up for. And I actually do want to move to Costa Rica sometime in the future. So that's part of the plan. To answer any questions on getting to college, anything career-wise, how to start budgeting, how to start saving, investing. 
So we actually have, Malai, are you on the call? <laughs> we have, uh, we have a student who interviewed a bunch of her friends after reading your article, and they, they had a question for you. We have another question in the meantime. Um, okay. What tips would you give college students for budgeting? So first of all, you've got to figure out how much money you're working with. So what I was doing when I was applying to college and even while I was in college was constantly trying to apply to scholarships because the scholarships do, they provide you like excellent like, additional money to work with to pay for your books to pay for your meals to pay for any necessities so the first thing i would do is trying to get more income coming in some more money at your disposal so look for scholarships there's scholarships for literally anything there's scholarships for having green eyes blue eyes red eyes kid you not scholarships for people that have left hands there's an app called scholly i would recommend downloading that app um, and it has an access like database of different scholarships so as far as you know, how to budget in college after figuring out how much money you have to work with. The next thing I would do is figure out what you're spending money on. So maybe track back for the last month, the last two, three months and say, you know, what have I been spending my money on? I've been spending a lot of money on eating out, on groceries, on entertainment, like on the movies, on my car bills, whatever it is, figure out what you're spending money on and you'll have that eye-opening insight experience like oh wow i'm spending way too much money on eating out i need to slow down there and i'm not saving any money so let me actually start saving money so figure out where you're spending too much money try to cut back there and then also prioritize saving money for the future so what i try to do with every paycheck is save at the very least 20 percent this is never seen 20 percent of paycheck goes right into my bank account right into my savings and don't have access to it in my checking account. So when you're budgeting, figure out how much money you have to work with in the beginning, try to pay more money, understand what your spending habits are, and then try to prioritize spending. I mean, sorry, try to prioritize saving instead of spending. And moving right along, um, Arturo Aguero, my husband is next. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Hopefully you guys can see this one and bring it up on the screen. Arturo, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, how are you? How are you, everyone? My name is Jorge Arturo Agüero, and the colonist of Yogi with the Moral. I'm from Ciudad Neyli, Costa Rica, all the way down south near to Panama border. And well, right now I know there's some friends from Costa Rica and also from Dominican Republic uh, watching us, you know. Um, how did I start on Motivos? Um, six, seven years ago, I started as a, um, Genetic Six and Motivos Magazines uh, events, non pain, non pain, uh, body <laughs> security. <laughs> you know, and then say, you know, a lot of things happen in my life, a lot of things happen all the time. And I need to take that look and share with everybody, with the kids mostly, and put um, a moral on it, right? And I mean, I want to read my, my piece on it. I want to do it in, in Spanish because otherwise it would take me, you know, <laughs> three, four hours reading it. You know? But okay, I'm going to read my piece. Uh, you know, can, is, is, uh, is everything right? Can you hear me? Right? Yeah, we can hear you. Everyone's on mute. That's why they're not answering you. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, let me read my piece, okay? Um, mi profesor de mecánica en el Instituto Nacional de, de Aprendizaje. En, en Suanyolina, eh, Ángel Serrano, algunas veces interrumpía sus clases para darnos algún consejo, contar algún chiste o alguna frase que nos ayudara a desarrollar nuestros valores y principios. Como éramos un grupo pequeño, él quería asegurarse de que tendiéramos a trabajar en equipo. Un día, durante un receso, nos dijo, ¿han escuchado que a los cangrejos disciplinados o disciplinados los llevan en baldes separados? No, respondimos. 
El profe, el profe se puso en medio de nosotros y empezó a relatar. Yo caminando dos baldes llenos de cangrejos, uno con tapa y otro sin tapa. Extraño, ¿no? ¿Qué tiene que ver eso con la disciplina? Le dijimos, ¿verdad? El balde, el balde que va tapado es donde van los cangrejos discípulos, porque saben, porque saben enlazar sus patas entre sí y fundan y se salen del balde. ¿Y por qué los que no llevan tapas son disciplinados? Preguntamos. Porque cuando uno hace esfuerzo, de más lo jalan de las patas hacia abajo. Eso es el chiste. Ahora la moraleja. Dice, hay varias moralejas en este relato. Una tiene que ver con el trabajo en el equipo cuya clave es cuánto podemos confiar en quienes nos, ro nos rodean, en quienes te apoyan y van cuando avanzas en tu, su carrera y tus, de sus, tus decisiones. También hay que saber que en todo momento de intensidad, tomarte un minuto para relajar mente, respirando profundo. Hay varias moralejas en este relato. Una tiene que ver con el trabajo en equipo, cuya clave es cuando, cuánto puedes confiar en quienes te rodean en quienes te apoyan y animan cuando avanzas en tus sueños, tu carrera y tus decisiones. También hay que saber que en todo momento de intensidad, tomarse un minuto para relajar la mente respirando profundo, o aunque sea con un machiste, es saludable. Ser parte del balde con, es ser parte del balde con tapa, es estar los cangrejos correctos. Ayudar, apoyar, enlazarse con buenas acciones y pensamientos positivos que hagan un fuerte para el triunfo. Por contrario, estarás Gastarás tus fuerzas tratando de encajar en el balde equivocado, donde al final serás arrastrado al fondo viendo cómo se suman tus sueños. Eh, well, that's, all, that's all I have. <laughs> that's all I have right now. You know, and actually, I don't know if you, if you guys can see me. I have a little cangrejo crap in my hand. But if you are looking for a friend, guys, I think Motivos could be your best friend. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. Any questions? Algun? You guys have heard that story. Maybe I, I know it's a story often told in Puerto Rican culture as well, the crabs in the bucket story. Go ahead, nod your head if you've heard that story before. Right? Yeah, Eric's saying laugh out loud. Did our hero fall into the bucket? <laughs> nice one, Rafi. But the different stories, right? Uh, the different crabs in the different buckets are that, you know, if you're around the right group of friends, as you're climbing out, you're getting out and you're pulling them up and they're getting out and they're pulling you up and they're getting out. If you're in the with the bucket with the wrong group of friends, as you try to get out, they pull you back in. They say, what, you're going after your dream? I'm having none of that, come back down here. So the moral is make sure you're in the right bucket of friends. Make sure you got the right crabs on your side. All right, I'm gonna bring up uh, Natalia Nottingham, Natalia was on the cover of our Resilience Edition. So let me see if I can share the screen. Perfect, Natalia, passing the mic. Okay, yeah, hi, I'm Natalia. I am a senior at Cornell University. And as Janae said, um, my work was in the Resilience themed edition and my piece was titled The Secrets Behind the Scars, Masking the Psychological Pain of Prolonged Trauma. Um, I wrote about how self-harm for me became a means of coping with the effects of trauma and I wanted to write about this because I feel that this is a topic that is very, very highly misunderstood and often highly censored. So there's been a huge increase in the amount of discussion surrounding mental health rate recently, which is amazing, but often we are still either completely avoiding or censoring a lot of the really difficult and uncomfortable topics. And by censoring those topics, we're sending this message to those who are struggling that it's something that needs to be hidden. And it kind of just drove me crazy to think how many people there must be who were suffering in the same way that I was. and not comfortable reaching out for the help they needed simply because of this ongoing stigma and this ongoing shame surrounding these issues and because we're not talking about it. And the thing is, even when we do talk about it, it's often in terms of like numbers and statistics and diagnostic criteria. And those are all things that are difficult to relate to on a more human level. So difficult to connect to on a more emotional level. And I wanted to provide that other side to the story. I wanted to show what it was like to truly live with this um, on a daily basis in terms of the more human and the real and the raw uncensored 
part of the story. And in doing so, I was hoping to both provide compassion to any anyone going through something similar and also to hopefully provide a different perspective to anyone who may not have previously understood what this was like and I feel this is I very very passionately feel that this is something super important because trauma is something that affects all of us so even if you yourself feel you have not been through something that could be labeled as trauma I can guarantee you that there are people in your life who have and you you might not even realize it because often we don't appear um, to fit this stereotypical image of what you'd expect of someone who has been traumatized um, but I think most importantly more importantly than that no matter what you've been through, all of us have gone through points in our life where we are struggling or having a difficult time overcoming something. And sometimes we will be the ones providing support to others. And sometimes we will, we will be the ones needing to receive that support. And I think we really need to normalize this idea that our strength and resilience doesn't depend on having to push through something alone and our strength and resilience isn't defined or determined by how much or how little we need to lean on someone else in order to get through what it, whatever it is that we're going through. So I'm going to read a sh short piece from my article that I think really captures the message that I want people to take away from this. Um, so I wrote, trauma exists on a spectrum that in many ways affects every single one of us. We all must process difficult life events and how we do that shapes our perspectives and influences our interactions with the world around us. Instead of being so quick to judge ourselves and others for how we respond, we should recognize that our response is developed as coping mechanisms and subconscious attempts to navigate the obstacles that we were facing. Instead of shaming ourselves for doing our best to survive, we need to start giving ourselves credit for all that we have survived. To those going through a tough time, reach out. You are not a burden, you are not selfish for asking for help, and you do deserve to be happy. Arriving at that place of happiness may be the hardest task you undertake, but it will be the most rewarding investment that you can make for yourself. You are worth that investment. To those supporting someone through a tough time, listen to understand, empathize, seek a new perspective, and forge connection. Even if there are no words to mend the situation, be a hand to hold, a shoulder to lean on, a body to hug. And for both groups, challenge the image that comes to mind when hearing the words mentally ill. It's those you'd least expect who may be carrying the heaviest burdens and fighting the darkest battles. Recognize that it is indeed possible to be vulnerable yet still courageous, delicate yet determined, fragile yet resilient, and broken yet relentless. And I'm just going to end by saying how grateful I am to Motivos for providing me with this platform to share my message and share my story and I'm so inspired by hearing everyone's voices right now and so inspired by the work that Motivos is doing to just connect different cultures and share such uplifting and powerful messages so yeah thank you <laughs> and thank you Natalia Natalia we dubbed Natalia the inspiration in our community for the resilience edition which came out as coronavirus was rearing its head mid-march and you know, the, a big point that she's making there too is that we all need to be seen in defeat as well as in victory. So today we're all celebrating the success of being published and getting our voice out there, but we need to be seen, we need to be heard in those times of defeat when we're struggling um, to raise our voice, to sit up straight, to even open our mouth. And that article is very powerful. If if anyone would like to receive that article, I can easily send a link to the, the digital version of it. Um, and at the end, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to subscribe and to support the work and to get a link to the latest edition as well. Um, now, Natalia and I, this is funny, right? So some of you know that I was a gymnast as well, also at Cornell Division One. not nearly the same age as Natalia. So no, we weren't teammates and we did not know, know each other that way but we had a coach in common. So the assistant coach when I was a gymnast there is still an assistant coach, what, 25 years later. So now you know I'm all, how old I am, right? But she had put a story out there on her Facebook page, so social media, and I clicked it at like two in the morning when I couldn't sleep and I read it and I said, wow, this, this needs to reach our readers. And I wrote to Melanie, and Melanie wrote to Natalia and Natalia wrote to me. And so this is how stories can happen, just noticing where they are. So Liz Marty, if you see Sabrina out there somewhere, you go after her, 
right? You follow up with her. Um, but that's how the story came to be. And then as Natalia and I were corresponding, we realized, wait, we have met in person before. Do you want to tell them that story, Natalia? <laughs> Yeah, so Janae, so I am originally from Philadelphia and Janae had come to speak at my high school. So I went to Masterman High School and um, this was my senior year. So I was already in the process of applying to colleges and I knew that Cornell was pretty much top on my list. And I remember Janae had mentioned um, when she was talking that she had a background where she was from, she went to Cornell and she was on the gymnastics team. So I went up to her afterwards and I said, I'm looking at Cornell, I'm a gymnast. <laughs> um, and we kind of connected over that. And then when she reached out to me, when she read my story and reached out and asked if she could republish it, I emailed her back and I said, were you that same person I talked to after, <laughs> after you spoke at my high school? So that was, that was really funny. It's just, it's funny how, how it's such a small world and yeah. <laughs> and Indian thing, she's a Masterman alum as well, yay. And, and the thing with republishing, right? You have to get permission from the author and also from the publication it was in before. So that was, what was the name of the other online publication? Um, Athlete Humanity. So it's a website that's dedicated to um, erasing stigma and mental health specifically for NCAA athletes. Right, and then we often work with the original author to edit the piece, to edit it for length, edit it for content, edit it for perspective perhaps. So there's a whole back and forth that still happens at that point. Um, and the and the Thing I want to say there is Karima your original Yuma in Cuba was seven pages parts of that story could be ready for a different kind of publication different audience or a different format and usually when Karima writes it's very long and so this is why I watch this I see this right and recently connected Karima with an executive editor at a publishing house because I really think Karima has a book in her guys right so Carmen I fully I'm speaking this into the universe Karima is going to be on your stage in the future as a published author of a book, all right? So watch out for that, everyone. Remember remember that and- That would be fantastic. See? Thank you, um, Natalia, though, for sharing your story because you were super vulnerable in your story in the magazine and it takes courage. It takes courage to do that. And many of us have been through traumatic experiences and have trouble putting them to words that others could understand. And your words help the reader empathize. They help the reader get as into your head and as into your shoes as is possible without actually being you. And you have an amazing way with words. And so I highly recommend that, that story. Um, and like I said, at the end, we'll give you an opportunity to get those stories. Look, India saying Karima 2025 Pulitzer. <laughs> Do we have time for a question, Janae? Yes. Okay. Um, Liz Mari asks, what were some ways in which you were able to overcome these hardships? Um, so, I mean, like I mentioned, I think reaching out for support is a huge thing. So I was lucky to have an incredible support system. Uh, my parents were very supportive. My friends were very supportive. Um, and I think that's really important for the days when you can't find the strength within yourself to keep going. I think having those people that you can reach out to who can see that strength in you, even when you can't see it in yourself, um, that's very, very helpful. But I think also one thing that's been helpful for me is just taking things one day at a time and just waking up every day and making a commitment to yourself to do what you can to heal, do what you can to help yourself in that moment. So, I mean, I'll be honest, like I still have really, this is still something that I'm working through. I'm still going to therapy and processing trauma and that's something like no shame around that. Um, but I still wake up some days and feel like I can't deal with this. So I think on those days, it's really just take things one step at a time if like getting through the next month or the next week seems like too much just like focusing on that one day and like making that commitment to yourself to keep fighting for that one day and like making that commitment to do what you can in that moment whatever that means for you in that moment thank you are there any other questions okay i'm gonna share the screen and bring up Olive, so Olive is our writing instructor and they were instrumental in starting Olney High School's first ever youth magazine through Motivo's connection there at the school for over a decade. And so very proud of the fact that Olive was able to pivot with the times uh, starting this magazine in January and having to pivot already in March to an online version. So Olive, passing the mic to you. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be here and hear from everyone. Yeah, so um, I've been working with Motivos for around a year and a half now, time flies. Um, 
and I serve both as a writing instructor. So I teach writing workshops for, um, for the, the team and I work individually with writers to work to like help prepare their pieces for publication. And then, um, I also help to start only magazine, which is, um, like a Motivo supported student run publication at only charter high school. Um, fun story. We started that in January of 2020 fun time to start a thing. Um, and met, you know, in person about five times before, you know, um, everything went downhill. Um, with the world, but um, we were able to um, pivot to having a, um, a WordPress where students um, could just write about how they were feeling with quarantine. I think at first, you know, we had all these great plans about doing all these interviews with other students in person and like coverage of like sports teams and stuff that ended up being just completely not what, what could happen. Um, and I was really proud of the team's ability to, um, to say, okay, well, we're journalists, right? So we're writing about the world and the world has changed. So we are gonna change how we're writing. Um, I also, um, in terms of, I can drop the WordPress in the, um, in the Zoom chat in a minute. Um, I also did wanna touch on some of the work that I've been really honored to do with some of the people who are on this call. Um, I think what's really special about like holding a teaching role with Motivos is that like all the team members are here because they actually want to be here. They actually want to write. Um, and this can put me in the, um, this can put me in the like kind of almost difficult position of taking a really excellent thousand word essay and saying, all right, this is great. We need to chop it in half. Um, looking at you, Karime, <laughs> or like, okay, you've prepared, 25 like incredibly well-researched questions for this interview you're going to conduct. Now we need to cut it down so the interview doesn't last like four hours. Um, and I think what's, which is like such a privilege as a teacher because I feel like so much of the time it's like to be, to be given to, to like be working on something that's had so much effort already put into it is like such a gift. Um, and I guess like I try my best to sort of use the editing process as a part of the writing process and like incorporate like critical thinking and asking questions and saying, okay, we're not just trying to cut this down so we can translate it and fit it into pages. We're asking ourselves like, what's the central theme of this piece? Like what story am I telling? What details are indispensable, et cetera. And I think, oh, Michelle is trying to get back in. Um, I think I let her in. Um, I think my favorite moments working with Motivo students are like when a writer's words sort of like do the thinking for them. I want to highlight, I know we talked about the Visco Girl piece earlier um, by Lisa. I want to highlight because I have this vivid memory of um, talking to Liz Murray on the phone in the basement of a frozen yogurt place on Frankfurt where we were having um, a fundraiser. And I remember reading the draft and um, kind of like teasing out and thinking through this idea that like, hey, like people are kind of making fun of these young women for like starting this trend, but they're probably like doing more for the planet than a lot of like real adult environmentalists. And from there, like talking it through and moving in the direction of like, not just analyzing the trend, but analyzing like how the trend was received in our society and also kind of taking a side, which is a really brave thing to do as a writer. And that's, how we ended up with the title um, in defense of the Visco girl, um, which I just think is like a cool example of like, just like the students, like like the work doing the work for itself, you know, like just like you read this piece and you're like, oh my God, there are these incredible ideas here that just by asking a few questions, we can really like tease out. Um, okay, so this is the WordPress for Only Magazine, which we started um, last semester. Um, so we have like poems, um, thoughts on quarantine and essay on mental health. Um, one of my favorite things that happened with this was one of the students who was really, um, like really instrumental in getting this started 
like I knew she was an incredible writer and then it turned out she was also a really good graphic designer and had this like really unique skill set and like really unique like um style that I I don't think I would have realized if we hadn't been forced to start a, like a WordPress instead of um, a print magazine. So that was really cool. Um, I am going to pop this link in the chat so that y'all can peruse at your own leisure. Um, it's all I have pretty much, thanks so much. And I think if there aren't questions, I can't tell if there are because I'm screen sharing. I think we'll keep going because we have yeah, like six we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to bring Malaya up, Olive, yeah. if that's all right. And if yeah. you put the link right in the chat, people can check out Olney Magazine on WordPress. And just want to express my gratitude um, for Olive because I was juggling a lot of editing and getting sponsorship and coordinating copy editing and translating and design and delivery and it was a lot and so this has been such a help um so i want to say thank you from my heart to your heart olive for coming on board um and we are always looking for support because i need to give olive a stipend i could do things for free when i need to scrape by but olive needs to live right um and i don't want to take that from olive and so we are always out there looking for sponsorship support and and in doing so, you're making our program sustainable and you're giving our gift to more students who can then join because it does take a lot of time to work with the students. And when we give that time, we cannot spend that time uh, working somewhere else, right, to pay the bills. So I'll just put that out there to thank you in advance. When I mentioned that another time, someone wrote us a check for $500. So if that is you on this call and you are able to do that, we appreciate you. We need five of you for our writing program. So I would just put that out there. Um, thank you. And um, Malaya, if you could come on up, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here and make sure I share the screen for Malaya. Good afternoon. My name is Malaya Combs. I am an 11th grader at Marion and Bassetti Academy um, in North Philadelphia. I am a team contributor for my TVOs. I believe I first heard of my TVOs and I first joined my TVOs in mid August. So I really haven't been with my TVOs for too long. I can say, one thing I can say though, joining Motivios was probably one of the best things I did. I first heard of Motivios from my assistant principal. It was, and it was first presented to me as a journalism program, which kind of made me excited to join because I really love writing. And I feel like just by joining Motivios, it would allow me to turn my creativity into something beautiful. As I get older and starting to admire writing more, which kind of more eager to join Motivios because I wanted to write. And I would say that another main reason is I joined, I joined with TVOs is because of the youth-filled environment. So what I mean by the youth-filled environment, I really like the fact that teams similar to me, who also are my right in, were a part of one team, just bouncing ideas off each other and giving each other feedback. And nobody is criticized or made fun of. And we all have different strengths. So I have a strength in like social media and like the marketing a little bit. So I was able to take that and apply it to the Motivio social media. And then I, what I also really like about the Motivios youth, the umph and the team is that everyone wants their voices to be heard and we kind of have the same, we have the same purpose to join in the team. And we all have really bright ideas, which is to be heard and have our stories um, out for people to hear. And that's why I believe the team is also really effective and working together. And after kind of being able to experience that, that team um, environment, especially the Motivios team, it made me want to join Motivios even more. And since I joined the Motivios team, my, I feel like my effort and my ability to work with a team and split tasks upon, um, upon everyone and others, I feel like I, that has strengthened. So with my history with my TVOs, I was able to create teasers. So the, one of the teasers, well, both of the teasers have to do with Brian Rodriguez's article, Keeping Your Financial Vision 2020. So I, um, what I did for that teaser is I reached out to some youth and I got a lot of um, youth from different programs involved and I was able to ask them a few questions based on like their future goals and like, their visions and put that video together and then within my TVs I was also able to brainstorm a series of stories for the magazine so I think I have about five stories that I'm currently working on and I feel like Motivios really has helped me get involved 
but it also has taught me that being involved can help you find different things that you like or that you're passionate about. So just from being a part of the team, I realized that I like writing more, more than I do, well, more than I thought. And Miss Renee, she has been really helpful and letting me turn my ideas into something creative. So the first story I wrote is called Through Mentorship, I Found My Passion. This story is based on my experience with mentorship in the medical field. And it tells the story of a girl, me, who was looking for her passion, but with doubt. And also tells how my mentor helped me realize what was in me. Not only does it tell what my mentor did to help me, but it also is, um, goes into how I found what I was passionate about. So I'm gonna read a piece from my magazine. Well, my story, it says, having a mentor to guide me made me realize my love for medicine. One experience that really impacted me was the heart anatomy lab. We went over the chambers, ventricles, arteries, and how the heart pump, pumps blood. I was able to hold a real human heart. I saw it with my own eyes, perfectly shaped, mind blowing. This is what my heart looks like, fascinating. It was amazing. This event gave me some insight on the heart, which changed me. It changed the way I think, even my goals. That's when I knew this field was meant for me. So I think what really inspired me to write this story is one wanted to appreciate mentor for helping me find my passion, which is medicine. And also other teens my age are the ones that inspired me to continue fin or finish writing it. So this story is kind of a way for me to share my experience with the youth because I know that many teens my age can relate to being challenged or having doubts about themselves, especially when deciding what they are passionate about. So everyone wants to make like go into a career and make sure that they're doing something that they love. We don't wanna be stuck doing something that we don't like. And I just felt like writing this story would allow me to share my experience, to show, to, sh to show the youth, the young, that there are people that want to help them, people who want the best for them and there are resources, but it's a matter of getting that help. And sometimes it could be really hard to have motivation, especially in the world we live in. And it's hard to get access and get the things we need in order to succeed. And life kind of just throws obstacles at us and we're kind of just placed in it with no instructions. And I think having a mentor's guidance can really be helpful. So I'm not saying that mentorship can give us all of those or everything that we need, but it at least meets us halfway. So it can at least help us get the resources and build our network, our network and get, um, meet people who are in fields of our interest. And I feel like mentorship has really changed my perspective and given me a better view of my work and my, my world and my chance. And I learned to see the bright side of things instead of the bad side of things because of mentorship and to do things passionately with a purpose. So before I wouldn't say I exactly did anything without a purpose, but I would say I just did anything, did things because I thought it would like benefit me. But now I learned to do things because I'm really passionate about it and it can really help me go into the medical field and be successful. So I believe that my story can reach many youth and which it will show them I did it, so can you. Teens my age are really the ins are my inspiration and why I wrote this story. And even though the story is just my point of view, I think it will encourage many to go after what they know and love, no matter the obstacles, and hope that many see that I want them to succeed. And that's my overall purpose for writing this story. Thank you. Would anyone like me to answer any questions? I just want you to read in the chat there, Malai, because you're getting a lot of thumbs up, awesome, great job quotes malaya is a true go-getter and we're gonna we're gonna hold these questions you can ask malaya questions but i want to make sure we get eric and james and desiree and michelle in there so i'm gonna share my screen hold those questions for malaya i know you've got them and i'm gonna have james um and eric come on now james and eric have the same they're on the same page in the article so eric if you would jump in and then james you'll be right after eric Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Helena. I graduated from uh, Penn State University with the bachelor's in electrical engineering. And now I currently work for the city of Dover as a, one of their electrical engineers. I, I found out about uh, Motivo. First, I want to say, this is great. This is, I haven't seen people my age in so long. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I found out about Motivos from uh, my sister, Jerica Helena. She wrote two pieces for Motivos and was actually at the um, 
at the Meet the Author back in uh, November 2019, she attended. Um, she's a psychiatrist um, working in Allentown right now for St. Luke's Hospital. And um, I remember her coming to me and she's like, oh, you know, Janae re reached out to me and she said, um, there's this uh, piece on resilience. And I know like you had a hard time in college. Like, do you think that there's any wisdom you can sort of, you know, provide for that? Because I remember her asking me beforehand, months before, you know, when she was just writing stuff, she said, would you ever be interested? I'm like, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it'd be great. You know, back to what Janae said, like, I, I want to be a watermelon for people. You know what I mean? Like, I, I like sometimes, sometimes people need watermelon. And I think the, um, the reason that I'm so resilient is because of my support system, because of the family that I have, the friends that I have in my circle. And not a lot of people have that, you know, for the people who don't have that, I think it's important for them to, you know, for, for other people's altruism to come together. So, that, you know, you, you have this sort of, um, this, this non-parental, non-friendly, just support that you can, you know, find online and, uh, you know, within the Motivas magazine. Um, to, to, you know, I, I haven't attended any event. This is the only piece that I wrote, um, the, the Don't Lose Faith piece for the Resilience Edition. Um, but I definitely like to, to continue to be involved. And I think today is, you know, this is, I guess, my second event. Um, it's fun. It's fun. I, I think a lot of you have like super interesting stories. Um, you know, if I don't have the time to read these, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting the best of both worlds. Like I find out about the articles and I'm like learning about where they came from. Um, so I'm going to read a little piece from mine. Uh, why am I getting called? I'm sorry. Um, so um, one of the one of the interesting parts of, of uh, my piece is um, just 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 towards towards the end it's like a like a mantra you know it, it's important to avoid comparing your path to success to anyone else's because you'll never be satisfied with your accomplishments and never get over your failures failing does not make you a failure if you learn from your mistakes and remain resilient you're guaranteed to move forward with your education and persevere in whatever you set your mind to um i know that for me i had quite a hard time in college from day one um, I, I went to WB Saw High School in, in uh, Roxborough, which is close to Philadelphia, or it's in Philadelphia, something like that. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily a very challenging high school. So going to Penn State, it just, it all hit me at once. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I sort of struggled all the way throughout, you know, being a first generation college student, I, I didn't really know how to schedule the the advisors had so many people in engineering that they really couldn't provide you with like you know some some supervision or, or some assistance that um a uh, a school counselor would in high school uh, my counselor in philadelphia she um my high school counselor she was the counselor for four different schools she was only there one day a week servicing four different schools across Philadelphia. So she, she was really spread thin. And so not a lot of people had, you know, you know, the, the assistance And I know a lot of people in my college or in my high school, you know, they were going to be first generation college students. Um, and so, you know, even, even for those people who, who are like me and who have made mistakes, you know, scheduling errors or scheduling all your fun classes in the beginning. And then, having two 21 credit semesters back to back, it's really stressful. Um, and if I could go back in time, I'd change a few things, but you know, no regrets. I'm here. I, I kept pushing forward and, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I can, I can share my story and, and hopefully someone else reads this and, and, you know, it, it clicks for them too. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And we're going to hold questions for Eric. They're in the chat. So Eric, you can see them and then we'll respond to those at the okay, end. Cool. And uh, James, if you would be so kind as to share parts from your article and kind of the, the thoughts behind it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can everyone hear me? Yep. 
Cool. Um, yeah, my name is James. I'm a rising senior at Cornell University. Um, found out about Motivos through Janae, who, yeah, was in Cornell as an undergrad and used to live in the same housing cooperative as I do now. Um, last year, we hosted Janae for a communication and self-advocacy workshop uh, for the community. And a bit afterward, Janae reached out to me um, and asked if I wanted to write. And here I am. Uh, so the first piece that I wrote uh, was back in January. Um, it's about being sick from a virus. I know it's coincidentally and awfully fitting. Um, so I've abridged it a little bit. Um, so here I go. With university's never ending treadmill, treadmill of drudgery, there's no good time to be sick. In my freshman year, I coughed my way through a week of classes to the dismay of all of my classmates and professors. During that week, I stayed up late to trudge through schoolwork, exacerbating my symptoms and infecting my roommate. Eventually, my uvula, the flesh that hangs from your throat ceiling, was so irritated that it drooped onto my tongue. I realized that I inherited a toxic mindset from my years at high school, that I had to dig in and wade through any storm. Uh, I developed another fever in my junior year, but I knew I could not repeat my mistake. I tucked myself under my bed sheets for days, my homework and deadlines left me in the dust, but I had learned that fighting through illness did not reflect strength, only stubbornness. Uh, had I not taken care of myself, I could have gotten my housemates and my classmates sick. Uh, so to me, resilience is not, not the ability to brave through a storm, but to know when to batten down the hatches. Um, with this piece, I thought it was really important to highlight my mindset of toughing things out when I should really be treating my body in a healthy way. Um, I think that many people, not just me, internalize this narrative of like working ourselves to the bone um, at college and uh, at work. Uh, for instance, we have no mandatory federal paid sick leave. Um, a lot of Americans can't afford healthcare, so they don't go to the doctors. Um, schools even need like a doctor's note for students to prove they're sick. Um, like my parents never had time to like take me to a doctor because they have work. Um, so I, I went to high school six so many times. Um, but yeah, I think these policies um, and systems really warp people's perceptions of what they're entitled to. And for me, I had to unlearn those perceptions. Um, our minds and bodies deserve to be treated better by society and also by ourselves, especially amidst this pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Questions at the end. Thank you, James, for sharing that. It's very indicative about how, you know, some some people still don't want to wear masks, right? Because it's a, it's an infringement or it's an extra thing, but yet it keeps everyone healthy, or at least it should, right? So it's very relevant even to today. Um, so that was kind of the college prep section of the magazine and now the career section. So we've got a couple of speakers on the career section. Desiree did an article on a band and I want to bring Desiree up now. I'm going to share my screen here. So, hello everyone. My name is Desiree Fernandez. I'm a sophomore at community college. My major is art and design. I'm also taking a real estate class. So I met Janae when I was around seven or eight years old and my brother was involved in Motivos. And I just remember seeing like these older kids talking and writing about their experiences like all through writing. And I knew I wanted to do something like that. So around my sophomore year of high school, that's when I got involved in Motivos and I published my first article, how to get a sports scholarship for student athletes. And from there, it's just been great. I got a chance to interview former councilman David O, at large David O, uh, former NFL player Tim Masticla, and Udini Lavos, which is a Panamanian rapper. So it's just great, and I've really stepped outside my comfort zone. So in this article, East, uh, it's an East LA band called Quetzal, and we just talked about their music influences, what inspires them, who, like, who would they like to collaborate in the future, and basically, one of my favorite quotes was, the life of a musician is not all glamorous. And that's so true because we see people in the media today, how 
oh, they're in, like, nice houses, nice cars, and all that, but it's true that, like, you know, your mental health, of course, is very important, and all that is just a front, so I love how they're so, like, genuine, that's why when I talk, when I was talking to them, it just felt like I knew them already, we're just having a conversation, and they're just really authentic, and yeah, it was just amazing, and they just talked about everything, how one of the musicians they went to school with, uh, Celia Cruz came to their school. It was just amazing, like uh, Tito Puentes. And it was just so cool because, you know, I'm Latin too and I love percussion, I love music. So it was just great to like hear all their stories and where they came from. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about your personal interest in music and some things you do on the side creatively besides writing. So I was into, I was really, I was, let me see. I used to like beats and I still do like beats and music percussion, but I think I kind of like, it's not good to say that I gave up on it, but I, I found another form of art, which is drawing and, um, and graphic design. So I'm learning that and I want to learn more about augmented reality, which is as you see the famous game called Pokemon Go. We just see through our phones are like filters that we do on Instagram. All that is augmented reality. So I'm trying to learn more about that and graphic design with starting like fashion and clothing. And I like soon hope to pursue that and start my own clothing brand. Awesome. And hold those questions for Desiree. If you put them in the chat so you don't forget she can see them, you might want to put Desiree colon and then the questions so we keep them all straight. And I'm going to bring Karime back up. So Karime has an article now in the career section um about Sofia de Leon who popped in here and had to pop back out she's actually running a restaurant while we're doing this so kudos to her and she's got a special since you guys have stuck around to the end we have one more speaker after Karime but since you've stuck around to the end we have a deal for you which is ten dollars off your order of fifty dollars or more at El Mercury at the end right or free churro with the order of a platter and so, and that's in person because the churros come with the ice cream and the ice cream would melt on its way to your house. So you have to go there. But the other one you can get where you are right now. So Karime, I'm going to bring you back up um, to tell us about Sofia de Leon and El Mercury and your wonderful conversation interview with her. So hello again, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Karime Font. Um, for my second and final article of the evening, I will be presenting Sobre Mesa, Motivos Talks with the Restaurant, which was in the new Vision Edition. And this was the first interview I have ever done in my life. And I could tell you that I was so overwhelmed and nervous with this. I just kept practicing and practicing just so I could get it so perfect. And, you know, as most things you do for the first time, it wasn't anywhere near perfect. But for this article, I interviewed Sofia de Leon, who is the owner of a Guatemalan restaurant called El Mercury, which is located here in Philadelphia. Um, I conducted this interview in mid-March, um, just before the world shut down due to the coronavirus. Her restaurant is located in Center City, and I have never actually seen the city so quiet and empty like it was that day. Um, we spoke about her experiences coming to this country for the first time alone um, to go to college and how once she started working in the food industry, which was what she studied, um, she saw a lack of Latino representation. So she wanted to do something about it and she opened El Mercury. So here's an excerpt, an excerpt of that article. Now it's mid-March and we are sitting in the unusually empty restaurant attempting to ignore the striking silence on this normally bustling downtown Philly street caused by the fresh fear that COVID-19 has reached the US and forced many businesses to close. I asked De Leon about her motivation to keep the business going when hard times hit. With the optimism and excitement she has maintained throughout this whole interview, she exclaims, what keeps me going is that this is my passion. This is my baby, this is everything. I have put so much work into, into it. We built the business from scratch. Failure is not an option. So does anybody have any questions about the article? We're gonna hold, sorry. We're gonna hold the questions till the end of the cell is still gonna go. Um, and this is the QR code from Sophia. And by the way, Karime, Arturo and I went down there. We ate a bunch of food, it was delicious. 
and she said you were super professional in your interview. So sometimes even though you think, ah, oh, it's not good enough, she said you were wonderful. So just to have that feedback to know how you came across to her. And this is the QR code, guys. So you could take a picture of this. Um, you can use the code Motivos20. So Motivos20, when you order online or when you call in, you mention it. If you go in person, you mention it as you're ordering on their touchscreen thing. Motivos20 will give you $10 off an order of $50 or more, or it'll give you the free churro with the um, order of a platter. And the platter has like two pupusas and like beans and rice with it or um, uh, aguacate con like plantain chips, et cetera. So take advantage of that. I know you're gonna be hungry after this. So that's El Mercado. It's 21st and Chestnut for those of you who work downtown. I know Gabby's dad has gone before as well. Um, and then for our last speaker, we're gonna have Michelle Severino. So this is Michelle. Michelle was also an inspiration in the community recipient on the cover of the Endurance Edition. And Michelle is a graduate of Temple University out in the work world now. Uh, Michelle. Um, hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, my name is Michelle Severino. I, um, like Janessa said, um, I graduated from Temple as a journalist and a Latin America studies major. Um, and I think, I believe I met Janae and got involved with Motivos about five or six years ago. And I believe we met through community college because I first graduated from there and then transferred over to Temple University. Um, and I believe she went to an event to, to kind of um, showcase her magazine and just talk about um, just what Motivo is and stuff like that. So I believe I got involved through that, through photography and just taking pictures and things like that. And a little bit about um, like the article that was written about me um, going above and beyond. It really meant a lot that I was um, featured in Motivo just because the last two and a half years for me has been really a real struggle, especially um, because about two years ago, I had an accident, and that really discouraged me to be able to just pursue my career and be able to, to you know, um, just encourage other uh, young people, which is like my ideal and my um, goal to be able to encourage other students to, to you know, pursue their careers. Um, and also because my brother passed away exactly two years and two days ago, um, and it, it really helps to know that there is other people that really like care for you and like actually want to see you succeed. Um, and like Eric and Jarena was mentioning, um, you can really let um, also uh, the success of other people, um, I guess, put you down. And is, that part is not really important because as, as soon as you know your worth and know your value to, to keep going and, and just be able to know who you are um, is really important. Um, and also like for me, um, now that I'm out of college, I've been working on working in different areas to, to work with young people. And currently I'm working at the internal revenue service, which eventually I want to be able to work in a grad program where um, I'm able to help recent undergrads who are coming out of school and be able to, to kind of do some type of mentorship and be able to teach them on like things that I have learned through graphic design and photography and, and things like that. Um, and just be able to, to tell them to never give up on what they want, especially like with um, things that I have done with uh, Janae and her magazine and being able to just showcase other people's talent and, and just being able to, to even like, through my photography show some type of like things that, that are possible out there as well. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what um, what I've been doing through Motivos. So just being able to, to work around what I love to do and just showcasing that to, to other people as well, so. And it's so heartwarming to see that you have worked with young people at Youth Build, yeah. like teaching them to brand themselves, to raise their confidence by giving them ways to honed their voice, so to speak, visually on paper. And now with the IRS recruiting students, giving them job opportunities. So we yes. thank you for that so much. Um, so at the end here, what I wanted to do was make sure that you guys had a way to reach back, to get involved, to let others know how they could also be a part of the magazine if they, if they wanted to. So if you have a young person in your life 
this is kind of the information to get involved. I feel like it's going to switch back. It did, see? Wow. Uh, to get involved in the magazine. So you have different ways to get involved. Um, subscribing, of course, to engage the youth. They, the schools will get an educator toolkit. You can subscribe in bulk, and that's just motivosmag.com. Press Get Motivos. There's discounts when the school gets a bunch of them, and they'll get the digital and the print. And I know schools are going virtual again. Hopefully in the spring, they'll be back in person. We do bring those magazines out to meal distribution sites, though. Many of the schools in Philadelphia have um, families that pick up food, and they're going to the homes for Thanksgiving, bringing those magazines with the food for them. We have Zoom uh, weekly chats with the students. So we have the Motivos team talk and trainings. Those are on Thursdays presently from 4.30 to 6. And so students are welcome to join those. We appreciate the support from the schools to subscribe in bulk and then choose two student representatives. That helps us sustain what we're doing. You can always contact myself directly. So Janae at Motivos Mag on email. Um, as if you want to do like a virtual talk or a workshop or something like that. So those are some different ways that you can get involved. And I'm just gonna put the website here in the chat. So it's motivosmag.com. And then all you've got to do is press the thing that says get motivos at the top. Um, the magazine is $15 a year. If you subscribe today, we're giving 20% back to Taller Puerto Ricano of that cost. So as many subscriptions, if all 32 people that were on the call today and the 27 that are still there do that, you do the math and 20% of that will go right back to Taller Puerto Ricano. So we appreciate that. And Taller appreciates that with all their programming needs that they have going on. If you want to sponsor, for example, our writing instructor, and I mentioned that cost is $2,500 for the year for the stipend um, for Olive's time, and we would love you to do that. You can send that, and I'm just going to be bold and put it right in here. Any amount helps, and you can just put it, if you've got a Venmo, for example, boom, there you go. Send it, and that will go right into us over to Olive. Um, to help with that. So we still need 1500 for that. Thanks. All right, cool. Yay. Awesome. I see people saying they're going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to support in any other way, um, you might not have financial resources and that's okay. I don't have a lot of financial resources, but I have connections and I'm a bridge person and maybe that's you. So if you know someone who would value this for their school, helping youth hone their voice and make their own writing go from the passive voice to the active voice to get out there, to get these stories out into the ether. Um, and you know, they say, if you see lightning in the East, you can see it in the West, it goes across. I was telling my students, these stories get through prison bars into prisons and there's uncles calling their nieces and nephews and sharing the stories that you're sharing. And they're sharing that inspiration through those walls back out. So you have no idea how far these stories go and um, we hear back. And so we thank you for that. And we ask you if you do have connections of those who could use our workshops, write your way to college, find your why, find your future, speak truth to power, let us know. If it's for a youth development session, let us know. Helping youth development workers uh, be more interactive uh, through Zoom, build those trust relationships, build up empathy, let us know. And so I will just stop there. Mark Carmen saying Motivo's rocks. You're very inspirational. Aw, and open it back up to questions at this time. I would love to send out um, a survey to everyone's email. If you can privately message me your email, um, that would be great. And I'll send it out to you just to get feedback. And when you do that, I will have your email and you will be the first to get the special edition Images in Quarantine, which just went to press and no one has seen it except the students who were on Thursday's call. And so if you subscribe today and if you put your email in that private chat, you will be the first to get our brand new Images in Quarantine edition. So with that, I'm gonna open it back to questions for everyone. I know some of you still had questions that weren't able to ask them because we wanted to make sure all the speakers had a chance. And if you're on here, I should say, I think, I think I'm rejoined. Amri is our illustrator. If you've joined and you wanted to showcase something, tell me and we can show, uh, yeah. Amri, if you wanted to show your illustrations, I can pull it up while people are asking questions. It was Gabby I would love to. You would love to, okay. So we'll take some questions while I pull up some um, illustrations that Amri has done. 
And if Lisa, if you can facilitate the questions, that'd be great. Yeah, we have one question for Gabby and then one question. I'm using my space bot on mute, but I can't see notes. One for Malaya also. I don't know if you both are still here. I'm still here, Malaya. Okay, um, so the question for you was, uh, what are your goals in the future for your work? So for the future, I hope my goals are to go into the medical field. So right now I'm currently in 11th grade. So I hope to go to college to major in biomedicine or like biology. And then um, like they can take it further into the future. I hope to go to med school and do like pre-med. And then career wise, I want to focus on surgery. So I kind of want to take a holistic approach. So maybe with the become a DO, which is a doctors of ophiopathic medicine in which I would do um, surgery and, I, and the type of surgery I hope to do is heart surgery so or any chest surgery. Um, so the type of heart surgery I hope to do or specialize in is like transplants. So that's kind of my future goals is just to kind of um, remain in the medical field or go into the medical field and kind of focus on surgery and also, while I'm doing surgery, I also hope to do a little bit of traditional medicine. So what that would be is I would do traditional pa um, practices, which would, like, instead of giving someone medicine to cure them, you would give them, like, herbs or, like, herbal tea to kind of try to help cure them. Or, like, if someone's having, like, trouble mentally um, or, like, physically, tell them to do, like, meditation or, like, workouts. So, like, that's kind of what I hope to do in my future for my future goals. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, is Gabby still here? Yes. Okay. Um, what inspired you to start writing? Um, well, I always, I always liked writing. Um, I guess what inspired me was um, my dad, my parents always found like, I never really thought about it before, but my parents always thought that I was a good writer. So they took me to Motivos and then I realized that I was good. And then I like got inspired by like, when I first published it, like my writing, I became more interested in it. Nice, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? This is um, Ree's work. Um, Ree, are you in Florida or are you in New York right now? I'm in Florida. Florida. So mm -hmm. none of us have met you face to face before. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? <laughs> Yes, um, I'm actually very excited to finally like put faces to like emails, but um, and I'm very happy to be here. But my name is Omri. I'm a current junior at Parsons School of Design. I'm studying fashion design in the systems and collection course and minoring in fashion business and entrepreneurship. Um, I started off in fine arts in fourth grade and started doing costume design in six. And ever since then, I've been merging the two in whatever way best suits a project. So I love doing these um, illustrations for you guys. It helps me practice and expand like my portfolio. So um, other than that, I'm actually, I have a brand as well. Um, so I do clothing and traditional paintings too. So being able to experiment all over the place is very, very good for me, so. And um, we came to us through Maddie. Maddie is the author of our fashion column and Maddie and I met when I was a speaker for her school, JP McCaskey out in Lancaster years ago when she was a sophomore in high school. So it just goes to show relationships. On Thursday for Team Talk, we had a talk about why mentorship matters. And something that Dan covered was 
kind of tracking and keeping those relationships strong over time. And you can see how over time, one relationship led to another, led to another. And that same thing can happen in your lives. So you've all met each other here today. And already Eric wrote that his sister is a DO and Malaya said she wants to be a DO. So already that connection has happened. And so keep doing that guys, keep doing that. Be bridge builders, reach out to each other. Desiree wants to know what the name of your brand is, Amri. My brand name is Re. I can put the link in the chat actually if you guys want to look at it. But I just launched a capsule collection um, and it's on there too, if you guys want to see that. That'd be great. Thank you. And we have another, we have some more people from Costa Rica joining us. Yay! And I think someone has a quick message for Gabby. Oh, that's that's for me. I'm Sherry Nottingham. I'm actually Natalia's mother. And Gabby, I think you might be the youngest um, author here. And I just wanted to tell you how powerful that was and what a strong voice you have. You're so articulate. And I'm not even gonna say just because you're so young, but you, you're, you're very gifted. And I wanna share a quick story. When I was in seventh grade, my father was in the army and I was living in North Carolina. And he said that we would have to move to Germany. I kid you not, I cried the entire five hour trip to Germany across the entire Atlantic Ocean because I thought I was, gr well, I was grieving the loss of my friends. And um, we returned back for a holiday and I was so excited to see my friends. And now you have to understand, I had gotten to see Germany, France, Netherlands, and, and a lot of part of Europe, but I still was missing my friends so terribly. So when I got back, I realized that everybody else was doing the same thing that they were doing a year ago. And, and I still miss them, but then I realized that I saw the world from a different viewpoint and different um, perspective. It made me realize when I went back to Germany at that time, it made me realize how much there is, um, even though we have to change and it made me really um, stronger and resilient. And so you have recognized at a very young age um, what change is all about and how you can embrace that. And so when I work in the corporate world, and this is my final message, I kid you not, we had change management consultants come and speak to us because what they said is change is the only constant, meaning no matter what we do, there is always gonna be change. And they talked about how you handle change is, and the mindset that you have is going to make you um, better equipped if, so I just wanted to let you know what you have been experiencing. And, it, and it's not that it doesn't come with pain because a lot of things that we have are painful, but I just wanted to tell you how powerful that was for me to even listen to because I was in that situation when I was in seventh grade. So I just wanted to let you know that it really resonated with me. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> my pleasure. You're, everybody here was, I, this was such an incredible forum and I was, I'm very grateful to have participated. So thank you to all. Thank you for coming and thank you everyone for spending this time with us. I know time is, is the thing most important that we can give each other. And so you've all given your time to us and to the others on the Zoom. <laughs> today. So I want to thank you and I'm putting in the chat um, a form of thank you. So this is a link to our resilience edition, which came out at the beginning of uh, coronavirus back in March. And it's a link to the video of the contributors talking about it. So you'll see Natalia on there and you'll see James on there. And you'll see Karime on there. And there's also a link to our educator toolkit. So keep those, share them with an educator you know. There's one in English and there's one in Spanish. And Olive was instrumental in putting those together with us. And so that's a way to really engage uh, young people in the content, help them think about how it applies to their life, challenge them to think about their dreams and to share that with a teacher or a mentor in their life. So that's our gift. Remember, send your email, um, do a little private message if you want to be one of the first ones to get the special edition, um, which is images in, corona, images in quarantine. So, um... Janae, thank you so much for, for this. As usual, it's always very incredibly inspirational to, to see the work that you uh, accomplish uh, with the magazine and for the kids. And um, 
you know, I haven't been so much in presence because I'm having a cold and I thought, which which it was, uh, would have interrupted with my sneezing and, and, and coughing. Um, but I appreciated every single uh, participation and, you know, this session was recorded, so we will be posting it in our website uh, in, in a few days or so. Um, so if you want others to see it, um, please, you know, share the link with other people. And thank you so much for your participation. And thank you, Lisa, for managing such a wonderful session. Thank, thank you. you yeah, thanks for thanks all of you. Yes, a lot of work. Thank you so much for putting this together. Bye.